numerical transformation optics. Really, I should just call this transformation optics, but here we are not using analytical equations to describe the cloak or the object, and our cloak and object can be any shape that we want to. And I'm showing that on this little simulation here where we've cloaked a pickaxe, and the actual cloak shape is within the outline of my university's logo, UTEP. And so it just shows there's no equation for that, that we can do anything with this new, fully numerical transformation optics. And we're going to break this into two parts. Steps one through five are going to calculate the coordinate transform using Laplace's equation. Remember transformation optics, it starts with a coordinate transform. It then applies that to Maxwell's equations and moves the math over to the permeability and permittivity. So the first whole half of this is calculating the coordinate transform here. However, if we don't have equations, this is done numerically and it's done by solving Laplace's equation within the cloak region. Once we have that coordinate transform, then steps six through nine, we're talking about how to calculate the permeability and permittivity tensors from that coordinate transform. So let's get right into this. Calculating coordinate transforms using Laplace's equation. Step one, we're going to build two arrays that define our cloak and our object. And these arrays are zeros everywhere, but we put ones in identifying either where the cloak is or the object that we want to cloak. So here we're going to have a device shaped like a triangle and it's going to try to conform waves around a circular region somewhere embedded within that triangle. So for this array CLK for cloak, zeros everywhere, but ones where the triangle is. And for the object, zeros everywhere, except ones where the object is. The next step is we want to identify the edges. These become the boundaries of where we'll solve Laplace's equation. So I call that E cloak or E C L K for the edge of the cloak. And just like the other rays, it's zeros everywhere except the ones identify where the edges are. And for the edge of the cloak, I'm placing ones outside of the cloak region. So where there's white triangles in this triangular, sorry, white squares within this triangular region, that's where the cloak was on the previous slide. And we place the edge on the outside. The edge of the object, we now have the edge inside the object. So the object on the previous slide went all the way out to where this edge is. And really what we have is two edges that are outside where the actual cloak will be. So to make this a little bit more clear, the here's our original array. The green squares show where our cloak is. The blue square shows where the object is and I've placed X is where we've identified these boundaries. And notice the boundary of the cloak is outside where the cloak is. The edge of the object is inside the object, however, outside the cloak. And that's really the theme. This green region is where we want to solve Laplace's equation, which is why we're placing these edges just outside of the green region. And so for the object, that places it right inside the object region. Now, once we have that, and we have this map of where the edges are, what we want to do is create mesh grids of our coordinates throughout our entire array. And if we do a point by point multiplication with these two edges, what we've done is isolate the X coordinates to our two boundaries that we've defined and our Y coordinates to the boundaries where we've defined. And so these are the first step in creating the arrays of the boundary that we're enclosing Laplace's equation into. Or we can think of this is where we're forcing the values when we solve Laplace's equation. These will be the known values or the boundary values. Now we have to do something yet with the circle. So this is sort of a more of an intermediate step. So really in this step, all we've done is isolate our X and Y coordinates to where our edges are. Then the next step, we need to adjust where those edges are so that we implement a cloak. 
So these two arrays on the left, this is where we were on the previous slide. These are our X coordinates isolated to where the boundaries are, and then our Y coordinates isolated to where the boundaries are. At this point, we need to force the coordinates around our object to zero. And that's what we see here. So th that boundary is still there. We just have all zeros. We're forcing those coordinates to be zeros. And we do that for both X and Y. Now, here's the big numerical step. This is where we solve Laplace's equation. Now, remember, there's still a boundary here. It's just that the coordinates are set to all zeros. And the coordinates out here are set to whatever they originally were. And so we're solving Laplace's equation at all the points in between. And we do this for both the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. And we can see the X coordinates are sort of you know, increasing left to right. But notice there's zero all in this entire object region. And the same thing for Y. We have values increasing you know, top down, but there's zero where the object is. So these are our transformed coordinates. And it's from those that we calculate our permeability and permittivity arrays. So numerically, this is the big step. So how do we do that, actually numerically? So we have uh, three steps on this slide. The first thing I like to do is build Laplace's equation for our entire grid. And so we have our derivative matrices and we have our column vector defining where we have our forced values. That's where we isolated the X and Y mesh grid terms to the boundaries. At that point, we'll enforce those boundaries and we're using this technique that we discussed in the previous video on solving Laplace's equation for enclosed problems. Just to remind you, this last term is zeroing out all rows in L that correspond to points with known values. We then add F to it, the force matrix, that places a one in the diagonal position. So we've thrown out the entire row of information that had a finite difference equation there and put a one in the diagonal position. And then down here, we pre-multiply our column vector B by this force matrix that zeroes out all the numbers except where there's forced values. And now we have a modified L and B that we can solve, but we don't quite yet do that. We're only, we only want to solve Laplace's equation in the cloak region. We don't care about outside of that. So we cross off all the rows and columns in our matrix equation that is outside of the cloak region and we get a reduced Laplace's equation that is isolated to just where the cloak is. So at this point, we've calculated all the values just in the cloak region, which is this strangely shaped triangle with a hole in the middle of it. But we have that solution now, and it's L inverse B. We then take this reduced solution, which is only in the cloak region, and insert that back into the big array. Another way we can look at our coordinate transform, uh, this is where we started, and this is our transform coordinates. And it's this that we calculate our mu and epsilon from. And notice where the object is, we set all those coordinates to zero. Calculating permeability and permittivity from the coordinate transform. The first step here is we need our background permeability and permittivity. And this is really up to you what you want to start with your background. I'm starting with vacuum here or, or just air. So we initialize tensors. So we actually come away with 18 two-dimensional arrays. We have nine for the permeability and nine for permittivity. Now, if the permeability and permittivity start the same, they will also end the same. So in fact, we probably only have to do one and then just copy the answer over. But if we start with them being different, then we need to track 18 two-dimensional arrays. Since we're making them equal, we'll just call all of the arrays epsilon. So we have nine two-dimensional arrays. We will initialize the diagonal arrays with ones and all of the off-diagonal arrays with zeros. So that's just air, and air is not isotropic.
we will need to build a Jacobian matrix for each point in our grid. And so inside that Jacobian is a bunch of partial derivatives. So we can pre-calculate those. And so we have four numerical derivatives. However, since we've already built these derivative matrices, we can calculate these numerical derivatives very easily. And so we're going to differentiate with respect to our ordinary X, our transformed X. That's one array. We only need four numerical derivatives here because it's a two-dimensional simulation. The Z doesn't enter into this. Those rows and columns are zeroed out. We have an ordinary derivative with respect to X on the, I'm sorry, with respect to Y on the transformed X. Down here, we have an ordinary derivative with respect to X of the transformed Y. And then last, ordinary derivative with respect to Y of the transformed Y. And so we have four numerical derivatives. And for a two-dimensional cloak, that's all we need. We don't need those other ones. If we were doing something in three dimensions, we certainly would. And these would all be three-dimensional arrays instead of two-dimensional. So that's data we can calculate ahead of time that we'll need for building our Jacobian. At this point, we set up a big double loop to go through our array. And we're gonna go one point at a time, do a bunch of stuff, to calculate the permeability and permittivity at each point. So step one in this, we need to build the background tensors. And so what we do, whatever point we are in our loop, we'll go into all 18 of these arrays and grab the value from each of these arrays and build our two tensors. So these tensors down here are not arrays at all. This is going to just be nine numbers and this will just be nine numbers coming from whatever point we are in the array. Remember, we're in a big loop, a big double loop over X and Y. And so whatever point we are, we grab those points and populate our permeability and permittivity arrays. And I'll mention again, if we started with the permeability and permittivity being equal, we only have to do one of those. Maybe uh, I usually just pick the permittivity. But if we started with those being different background values, then we have to do both. Okay, so at this point, we have two nine element tensors. That's the background tensor. We need to build the Jacobian in order to transform that. So very similar to what we did to the last slide, we go in and whatever point we are in our loop, we grab that point from our Jacobian arrays and we stick that into another nine element tensor. And because this is only a two dimensional cloak, we have just zeros and ones in the last column and last row. So these numerical derivatives only end up in this first little upper left quadrant. So we populate those permeability and permittivity tensors and the Jacobian tensor the actual, the same way. Now we move on to actually calculate the permeability and permittivity of the cloak. And so we're using the equations that we know uh, based on our Jacobian to transform that. However, we're doing something a little bit weird. We're using the inverse of the Jacobian in our transform instead of just the Jacobian. Now, why on earth is that? And that's because we actually need to do this transform backwards. We can't map. We've, we've set all the, the points around our object to zero. We can't map that single zero point to a bunch of points in the other grid. That's not possible, but we can do that the other way around. In our original grid, we can map a bunch of different points around the edge of the object all to zero in our transform coordinates. So we're actually doing transformation optics backwards. And so that's why we use the inverse of the Jacobian. Uh, but otherwise, we don't have to worry about that. We just use our standard transformation equations. However, with the inverse of the Jacobian to calculate our, our mu and epsilon. So in the previous step, we built our Jacobian. Now we invert it. And then we come down and we calculate our new permeability and permittivity tensors from the old ones. And I just overwrite the data. So we have our new permeability and permittivity tensors. However, that's just for one point on the grid. So we're gonna go back to our arrays and then put those numbers into our 2D arrays. And when we finish the loop, we fill all of this in. And we come away with the permeability and permittivity arrays that would cloak that circle inside the triangular region. And so our permeability permittivity arrays look something like this. And then if we could simulate that, that would cloak that circular region. 
simulating this, that's another discussion. And we have lectures and MATLAB codes on that as well. So we are done the numerical transformation optics. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.